Thank you for being here this morning. And uh, thank you to Open Source Bridge for accepting my talk and turning it into a petrifying keynote. <laughs> <laughs> and also, thank you to Sumana for sitting up in the balcony so I will maybe look up a little while I'm talking to you today. <laughs> so um, I wanted to start off with a little quiz. Uh, who knows what a trust fall is? All right, so a significant amount of people. We can discuss our, our relative traumas around that later. Um, it, for those who don't know what a trust fall is, uh, it generally involves a bunch of people with their arms out, cross-facing, and a trustee who gets up on high, varying heights. And the point is you're supposed to fall back without looking with your arms crossed and trusting the group to catch you with this motley net of arms. Uh, it was really popular with like leadership building and also at my summer camp. Uh, and I remember doing this trust fall with a group of girls and uh, I was already practicing a lot of um, imposter syndrome and feeling very <laughs> different than these girls that were being caught one after the other. And when it was my turn, I said, no, I'm not doing it. You, can't, you won't catch me and I'm not doing it. Uh, and they cajoled and they pleaded and I said, no. Uh, you know, I was a bigger kid than most, and I did not believe they would catch me. So they said, well, look, we'll catch this big adult counselor walking by. And they pulled this woman over, and she fell, and we caught her. And I was like, that's great, but you're not going to catch me, and I don't want to do it. <laughs> so I don't remember what happened in between there, but suddenly I'm up on a picnic table with my arms crossed. And uh, in the middle of falling back, I couldn't trust the exercise, and I threw my arms out to catch myself, and I broke the counselor's nose. <laughs> so what this told me was these girls were too different from me, and I didn't have a base sense of belonging to build with on, trust with on them. Without that foundational piece of trust, it's just a bullshit exercise where someone gets their nose broken. We, we can't manufacture trust with people when there's a deficit of similarity and connection. And for me, trust is built by positive experiences over time, which I did not have with this group. So uh, with that sort of thinking about trust in mind, and thanks to uh, gaining support from Mozilla, uh, I've been developing something called the Ascend Project. Now, um, this is specifically trying to assemble that baseline and to foster a group of connected people who will really see each other and have some understanding of each other's unique challenges to participation. It's an attempt to create a baseline from which those participants can take a trust fall as open source contributors. Oh, and they don't have to catch themselves. We're gonna go into that. So, no, I don't have that many slides. <laughs> Thank you, though. <laughs> uh, so who am I? Um, I'm queer, I'm gender outlaw, I was raised on social assistance. Uh, I was unable to navigate getting to higher levels of education at the usual time. Uh, so I did a lot of odd jobs, um, pretty much piecing together one to five jobs to make a living uh, from being a nanny, a uh, cook, unloading trucks at seven in the morning cleaning bathrooms at the local theater, delivering papers, basically always calculating how much money I needed to get by and piecing together the work to match that. Even though I might have been really interested in problem solving, that wasn't part of my job descriptions and it was never reflected in the pay. So I really have an understanding of what it means to go from that lack of security and move into something like what we have here. But I changed, I changed that circumstance for myself um, partly through a pretty significant uh, and scary incident where I stabbed a knife through my hand uh, while I was working in a kitchen and was unable to work for uh, about eight weeks uh, without a safety net and without health benefits and um, without being able to work. It was a real trigger for me of, I need to get a job with benefits, basically. And how do I get there? Um, what I had observed from other working class women in my life was that going back to school, even later in their lives, um, 
For example, my mother went back to school at 37 when I left home, and uh, another friend of mine also at 38. I saw that they had done that and had found jobs that now had a certain degree of security to them. And I wanted that, and the common thread seemed to be go back to school. Now, that's not always a level up, but I knew it would put me in a position for student-specific opportunities, namely, my program I chose had a paid co-op, and I'm like, I'm gonna take that, and I'm gonna turn it into a job. So I got into open source while I was in that college program because I had a really dedicated and passionate professor. Um, he created a course that connected Mozilla students with mentors within Mozilla, and we fixed real bugs on a real project. And in doing so, we had in the impact to the project, we felt really um, strongly as contributors to Mozilla, and it placed those of us who were successful in line for internships and ultimately job offers, which is what happened to me, and that's how I got started in open source, and that's how I ended up at Mozilla. But I want to say that a key piece of that path is that I never did open source for free, and you'll see why that matters later. So all the passion I have and had before I even learned about open source for things being free and equal and accessible and open and transparent and interesting and open for anyone to, to, to use never mattered as much as making sure I could fulfill my, my basic needs and that I was um, keeping myself afloat while working through school. Like I was focused on the prize, get a job, and it didn't occur to me ever to take, to volunteer in my non-existent free time to open source projects. I, uh, I also wanted to be able to be learning skills to take back to my communities which did not have high technical um, uh, help in them. A lot of people were afraid of technology from where I was coming from. So at that point, volunteering was about community fundraisers and free time, any free time, was for activism, uh, mostly that didn't intersect with technology. But as I was getting involved in open source, I was drawn to the political aspects of it, um, and it seemed like the right place for me. However, I was learning that in open source, there is a, a sort of a pattern or a stereotype of the average contributor, um, that they are people who have free time. Why some people have more free time than others is somebody else's talk, but I think people in this room probably have some ideas about that. But let's say maybe they're students with less homework than me, or it's not as hard for them, I don't know, or they do it on the side of a well-paying job. The overall sentiment I was getting was that contributors to open technology projects are so passionate, they would do it for free. And they do it, they care so much that they do it for virtuous and unselfish reasons, and that the community is then built around them, and their voices are the direction for the technology. Who are we missing when that's the typical path? Which projects end up growing vibrant communities around them, and why? What happens to an open source project when the norm of participation skews white and or male and or heterosexual and possibly affluent? There seems to be a high value placed upon those who stumble upon and then run gauntlets to become contributors more trust is placed in their abilities and intentions for having come up the hard way. I'm not gonna say it, but you might be thinking the M word right now. They contribute with no apparent benefit to themselves for doing so, but there is a lot of benefit, both in social capital and technical skills from participating in open source. So no one is ever truly doing it for zero reward, and many do so on the backs of the, individual, the invisible helpers in their lives. Hi, Lexi. <laughs> so the Ascend project is about pushing the agenda that it's not enough to expect that those who should be here are the ones who have found us. That there is a benefit to being a contributor in open source, and that benefit needs to be available to more people. So this is where the title comes in, Explicit Imitations. Instead of being alone and hitting a wall, maybe giving up, or perhaps figuring out how to break through, we're gonna invite people in. We're gonna say to them, you are wanted here. We need you. Your input matters. 
And we're here to catch you until you feel confident and connected. We're gonna create positive experiences in the onboarding to set a baseline of genuine trust. So then we put, our, put money where our mouth is, removing some of the barriers to participation as it relates to reasons why certain voices are missing. So the Ascend project provides transit, childcare support, equipment in the form of a laptop, daily meals, breakfast and lunch, and an honorarium for daily participation. These are the ways that we're really believing in someone, treating them like an intern or a new hire, like you're already one of us. And learning from that place, and I know this from being an intern in technology, is so different than trying to work your way in from the outside, especially if you don't see yourself reflected in the community you're trying to join. Because those of us in an already in a financially stable place and benefiting from race and class privilege will do some of this work so that those who often have to watch out for more microaggressions and systemic oppression and stereotype threat can take a little bit of a break from doing some of that extra work needed just to get by and use the space that Ascend will create for exploration, for learning, for skill building, and increasing the confidence to access these new communities with support. And this will lead to opportunity. Again, Ascend is trying to create a place where there is comfort. Participants are in a safer place to make mistakes and to learn new things. Because the investment is already made, there's no need to prove yourself. And it's really hard to trust this, but that's what we're trying to show. This is an attempt at a real trust fall. We'll be asking 40 people. This is a pilot project, so I'm going to be doing two 20-people cohorts, once in Portland this fall and once in New Orleans in early 2015, we're asking them to trust open source, to trust us, creators, developers, maintainers, current contributors, also, to also to learn how to contribute to code and, and also the quality of a project the size of Firefox, to make at least one significant technical contribution in the six weeks we'll be together. To be a part of this pilot and trust there will be new skills learned, new connections made within Mozilla, but also in the larger open source community. Ascenders in these pilots will need opportunities for further learning and paid work after this program. So I need your help. This is a six week program, but afterwards people will be seeking internships, entry level positions, contract work even, in the tech sector, help keep this momentum going and keep giving invitations to participate even as a contributor to your projects, but paid work is great. People need to get paid. I need you to be the people with your arms out ready to catch. So let me go into more detail now about the project. The application's been open since June 1st, and it's open until June 30th. Without any advertising on my part, because I'm doing this off the side of my desk, I have already got three applicants, and each one of them is a very viable candidate. When, we opened, when, when I started reading these applications, I couldn't believe what I saw. They, their, 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 um, their responses to the questions capture exactly the reasons this project was created. First generation college graduate, breaking the cycle of poverty, can't afford a code school, self-taught in web programming but not sure what to do next or what language just to learn or what to focus on. Two thirds of these applicants learned about Ascend through open source channels already, like the Open Source Bridge website or the GNOME mailing list. So that tells me that these are people who are looking for a way in and they just haven't found it yet, even if they're already near us. What's obvious too is that these are all motivated people and they're struggling to figure out how to get to that next level and craving an opportunity to go deeper as creators and developers of technology themselves. One just wants to make more than $11 an hour. So I'm hoping to create a right place at the right time moment, like the one I got, like the one many of you got too. And I'll ask you right now, think about what was your right place in your right time. What got you hooked into open source and who helped create that for you? 
Think about what your scaffolding was. Now, what are these people actually applying for? What will they come out with? Over the course of the six weeks, these are full-time days, we'll have a goal-oriented curriculum that targets uh, writing QA tests in JavaScript and using a Python framework to automate them, doing Firefox development with the actual browser, building it, modifying the source code, fixing bugs. Also, some of the peripheral tools of open source, IRC, wikis, things we may take for granted but that aren't necessarily known by everyone, code review, bug trackers, blogging, Blogging about successes and failures. This is about building up a, a person for themselves on the internet that is more valid in open source when you have that. Not everybody has that yet. Web literacy skills. Um, and then also awareness of their existing st and transferable strengths. Building confidence and participation based on that too. I mean, we're not dealing with clean slates here. The curriculum is still being developed, so I'm also looking for more ways to leverage the supportive aspects of Ascend Space in combination with other partnerships and experiences. For example, going to maker spaces, doing public speaking, developing interview skills, um, and developing a public-facing portfolio. Now here's what Ascenders need, and this is largely the reason I wanted to talk to this community today. We need meet and greets for each of these cohorts to become a part of the thriving community, especially here in Portland where there's such a great local community, we really need for them to meet you, and I believe you need to meet them. So arrange with me to come by and talk about your project, or have us come to you with a field trip, meet your engineers, do interview simulations with your HR. Also, we need mentors. A huge part of my experience getting involved in open source involved a channel in, on Mozilla's IRC network that was a mix of students and experienced developers, and people were in there very lively chatting all the time, whether about successes, asking questions, getting through blockage. We need that. It was, it's really key. People will work on things at different times of the day, and just having a chatty channel to be in and to not be afraid to ask questions in is key. So hang out and pound ascend on irc.mozilla.org. So we have that virtual community that is, has diverse experience levels. There's still room in the Portland cohort, so also please spread the word, ascendproject.org slash apply, I'll have that up in a slide at the end. Oh, also, we should be at this slide. So beyond these two pilots, I'm looking for other partnerships to grow this program out to more cities, and also maybe in some more organizations. So if it's applicable, talk to your companies now and find out if you could have an Ascend Project instance come and focus on your code and your community. So as you reflect on your own past, whatever support you got, I think that it's clear that passion is not enough. Scaffolding that rewards people who come from typical paths already exists. We need to build parallel pipelines that are targeted and provide some sa same safety and learning environment, but don't expect tier one schooling, specific levels of youthfulness, or a legacy of professional success. I'm trying to set people up to build genuine trust. That was the one where I wanted to talk about how people do extra work. <laughs> I was maybe not even going to have slides, which is why I forgot to click through them. So, you know, looking all ways all the time is very exhausting. And then this is just the happy ending where I want to ask you, I want everyone to ask themselves, who are you ready to catch? Thank you. This talk. I had mentioned that um, I wanted to be my part to be quite short because I feel like there's a great uh, community here and I really want other people to um, participate and help develop and help advise and just help, 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 help me. Because <laughs> uh, my idea was, oh yeah, this is like a 20% project I'm making up for myself and it turns out that's a lie. <laughs> it's like 120%. So um, I really do need people, uh, people's expertise, their experiences, um, their input. And also, um, questions that you ask me help me in figuring that out. Recently, someone asked me if I was going to have like a bug tracker. I was like, that's a good idea. So everything that Ascend is doing is all in a uh, repo, a public GitHub repo. And so you can file pull requests on everything from the website to eventually the curriculum. That's also where participants will have blogs, like just everything in one place. That bus rule, right? Because right now, one person on a bus and we're done. Um, so. In that spirit, I would love to take questions, and I will repeat them in the mic for the recording. Yes. 
Okay, so uh, Simona asked what I've learned specifically uh, among other places, but from the software carpentry project. Um, that, I did the one day at PyCon recently that Greg Wilson does a software carpentry workshop where he basically brain dumps into you the science of teaching and learning. Um, and it was tremendously helpful. I mean, that's why I'm saying that the curriculum is goal oriented. I learned from him that you should have, like you should teach to a goal. And I think that that's gonna be really key to how we make sure that every day for people who do ascend, at the end of the day, they have succeeded in meeting a goal and can leave feeling excited to come back the next day. I think that that's um, something that I've learned from that. Also, uh, some interesting stuff around like how people learn, like how to break things up into really small concepts and um, give people regular breaks to like absorb and come back ready to learn something new. Uh, I, th I think that another major component of software carpentry uh, was learning how people, like that there's different kinds of learning brains. So there's the novice and then the competent person and then the expert. And uh, I am by no means an expert, but I think I'm teaching from a place of competence, um, which is actually good. Because if you have an expert trying to teach a novice, you have someone who doesn't even see what they know and someone who doesn't know what they don't know. And that's like the biggest conflict you could probably have for learning. So when you're dealing with a competent person trying to teach a, a, new, a, a novice, you have someone who still kind of sees what all the steps are between point A and point B and can transfer that, that mental model to the, new, the novice, and then the novice can also then come up to a level of competency. So those have been two of, my, of the key takeaways, I would say, from the software carpentry. Yeah, um, so the question is, what kind of technical skills are people expected to have before the end of the program? Uh, mostly when I was trying to think of the admission criteria, I wanted people to be able to do the free uh, Code Academy JavaScript course online and just be able to demonstrate that they completed that, which takes them to the point of understanding object. And it covers, you know, for and variables and things. So just a very basic, and I thought we'd be able to build from there. And that also that would be a way of showing a little bit of investment on the part of the applicant to do this this task and then to bring it back. It was just similar to, um, I, think I, I think I probably got that from the OPW where they have to do a task and come back and there's, so there's a little bit of like committing to each other beforehand. That's all I'm expecting, but what I mentioned earlier about the applicants I've already got is that these are people who already do have this stuff. So that's gonna be really interesting and that's gonna guide some of the curriculum. Um, the reason that I picked, and I'm just, this, you didn't ask this, but I'll add this on, is the reason I picked the focus on uh, QA and testing is that I felt like that was a place where if someone was really struggling, if you can write one test in the six weeks, then that is a success for you. Whereas if you're someone who really picks up on it quickly, there's so much more you can grow out from that. But it was a way, and this is something I experienced in my education growing up, if you're able to keep people who are struggling and people who can kind of excel in the same room together and not have any, either of them feel ignored or lost or behind, then, that, then it's more successful that way. Okay, so um, yeah, in terms of spreading the word, any other, uh, any specific criteria to think about? Um, I tr we tried to keep the criteria pretty loose. I also thought about privacy, so I I'm not asking people too much about um, specific things, but we're saying that this is for people who are looking for a chance to break the cycle, break a cycle of um, paycheck to paycheck living and that kind of thing. So we're, we are hinting that it is for more of a, a like lower income background. Um, Age-wise, this is for adults. Uh, we, we will need people to provide W-9s so that they can get their honorarium. So I, I'm not sure if that means 16 or 18 or, you know, like working age in the U.S. Um, we have a legal person who will take care of that, but yes, adults. Um, and, and, oh, and also um, looking for people who are not currently students. So people who can commit to the, the full day part and who aren't, because when you're a student, you can get internships based on just having student status. So this is trying to target people who aren't getting those opportunities. Uh, so yeah, any other target cities I'd like to have partners in. Um, when I announced the send, somebody from Miami reached out and I think that would be a great place to do it as well, um, and then Mozilla does like a Hive network um, thing where they're teaching kids to code, and I was thinking we could maybe um, partner up to then teach the parents of the kids who are going to Hive, so like go to the Bronx where they're doing Hive New York City and do that, but also, I don't know if Cindy's here. Anyway, Cindy I met at PyCon and she was talking about um, going to Texas, there we go. Uh, <laughs> so that sounds exciting. And also I met somebody at Lesbians Who Tech whose partner works on a First Nations reservation up in upstate New York. So it might be, that might be an interest, interesting place to do a targeted one within, within a particular population. Um, 
People have also asked about taking this to other countries, but I do think there's a lot of work to do here, um, especially like in the American South, and I don't have that much access to it yet, but I would like to. Okay, so have you heard any objections to people like, no, I couldn't apply, and what would the reasons be? Um, that hasn't happened yet. I have not really spoken directly to applicants because it's in Portland and I live in San Francisco, so I've been relying a lot on help reaching out to local organizations and having them, like we have posters and postcards, by the way, I can bring those if anyone has places they think would be good to distribute them, um, but relying on that to try to get the word out for more applicants. There is a question in the initial application that says like, if there's anything that you, like, that you think we might not have considered and you wanna let us know about it so we could perhaps tailor to you, then we're gathering that. And so I think I mentioned these are pilots, and part of that is gathering that data. Like um, in, Outside In, which is a local organization here for youth to drop in, I was talking with their employment uh, counselor, and I'm going there tomorrow actually to meet some of the youth, and she was saying like for some homeless youth this may, be, may not be possible, but it's not, uh, it's not for all of them, right? So maybe some of them will be able to do it. Well, I'm looking forward to talking with her and finding out for the ones it doesn't work for, like what might work? Would it make sense sometime to have an Ascend where there's housing provided as well? You know, so like we may not be able to fix everything with these two pilots, but I'm totally gathering all that information so that it helps drive some of this. Because right now it's really flexible. We can sort of conf move to people's needs. And you know, for, for example, like one person says like, yeah, I can do the nine to five, but I have an appointment weekly I'm gonna have to go to and it's like, that's okay, like, we can work with that. You know? So I'm trying to encourage people to talk about it as much as they feel comfortable doing it so we can see either we can work around it for this one or we'll keep it in mind and, we'll, and, and see if that's something we could work on. Okay, um, so the question I'm just gonna shorten a little bit was about consideration of parents and providing childcare. Um, and, and actually that is considered in the Ascend budget. We, we do provide childcare support, um, so I budgeted out that when I made the proposal. Um, and so that's one of those things where it's on, it's on the application and we'll be gathering that and trying to figure out like, uh, we, we'll probably try to partner with We Village, which has drop-in childcare. It might be an easier setup, but otherwise we, we'll reimburse for um, registered childcare for participants who, who will be able to come if they can have childcare. Any other questions? Are we? I think we're we're good for time, probably. So, thanks again.